Okay, so in this section, we'll look at the uh, regulation of mean arterial pressure uh, homeostatically. I remember mean arterial pressure is defined as the average blood pressure over time. Uh, there are a number of different ways to calculate it. We're going to concentrate on this one right here. Mean arterial pressure equals uh, stroke volume times heart rate times total peripheral resistance. Uh, what we'll do is we'll look at each one of these variables, stroke volume, heart rate, and total peripheral resistance, and see how those are controlled homeostatically. Help, sorry, let me rephrase that. How those help to control mean arterial pressure homeostatically. Okay, so we'll look at each variable. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of fill in uh, each one of these, um, and we'll look at the intrinsic factors that help control it and the extrinsic factors. Intrinsic would be things that are involved with autoregulation from the organ or system itself. All the extrinsic would come from the three processes we've talked about before, uh, hormones, the ANS, and other. The other would depend on each system. So we'll start with heart rate and look at how heart rate controls mean arterial pressure. Oh, so let's kind of look here. Um, one of the things to remember then about this equation, right, and again, you should memorize it. Uh, if stroke volume goes up, mean arterial pressure goes up. If heart rate goes up, mean arterial pressure goes up. If TPR goes up, mean arterial pressure goes up. All right, so if any of those variables increase, mean arterial pressure goes up. If any of them decrease, mean arterial pressure goes down. So we'll just go through heart rate step by step and see what it does. So here's my heart rate, okay, and intrinsically, uh, how does it, uh, how is it controlled? Well, intrinsically, the heart rate is set by the SA node and its autorhythmicity. So uh, there's really, some people argue there's no intrinsic mechanism of the heart rate. Um, the reason they argue that is there's not a whole lot of evidence that the SA node changes its inherent rhythm, its inherent firing rate based on outside, uh, sorry, uh, factors within the heart itself. Um, and so people argue that that's not really a, technically an intrinsic control. But since the SA node is located in the heart and it does set the basic beat, I think is reasonable to, to think of it as intrinsic. So that one's pretty easy. It's the SA node that intrinsically sets the basic heart rhythm. Extrinsically, we'll look at the ANS. Um, the ANS has both the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of the ANS going to both the SA node and the AV node. So it has what well, we've talked about before, dual innervation. So let's look at the parasympathetic effects. For parasympathetic, remember that's inversely, right, controlled uh, with heart rate. So if parasympathetic goes up, heart rate will go down. Uh, conduction will go down as well, but since we're looking at heart rate, heart rate will go down. Um, how it does that is it stimulates the release of acetylcholine, that's the neurotransmitter, ACH, and that goes to muscarinic receptors, okay, and that uh, slows the heart if it goes up. Um, remember that when we talked about this kind of factor in lab, that the parasympathetic system had the most influence on heart rate when it was below 100 beats per minute. So it tends to be predominant at 100 beats per minute or less. Uh, the sympathetic, right, would uh, be the opposite. Remember, it's antagonistic. So if I increase sympathetic, heart rate goes up, conduction goes up. Um, why? Because you stimulate uh, the release of norepinephrine. Um, and that goes to beta-1 receptors within the heart. And uh, this tends to be the dominant system above 120, right? So remember, the sympathetic dominates during exercise, so at heart rates of 120 or above. The parasympathetic dominates at rest, so 100 and below, and in between is about half and half. So heart rate, pretty easy uh, uh, for that, uh, those factors. Uh, let's look at hormones now for heart rate. So there are two types of hormones 
that will have an effect on the heart. Um, the first we call in general sympathomimetics. So see that word there, sympathomimetics. If you thought about it for a second, um, you'd probably be able to figure it out if you don't know it yet. Um, sympatho refers to the sympathetic nervous system. That makes sense. And mimetic, it sounds like mimic, and that's what it is. Um, so sympathomimetics are chemicals that mimic the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, the big ones we would see in our body are norepinephrine and epinephrine. So they're the main sympathomimetics. Um, in addition, other hormones that would affect heart rate are their thyroid hormones, your T3 and your T, T4. So what is it? You know, triiodothyronine and tetraiodothyronine uh, are, are there. Um, and all of these hormones that we just mentioned, their job is to increase heart rate. So they have, uh, if we talked about it before in the ANS section, a positive chronotropic effect increase rate. Uh, interestingly, there's no known hormones that decrease heart rate. Uh, it's believed that is true uh, because of the potential danger with hypersecretion. So um, if you had high blood pressure and your blood pressure went up fairly significantly, um, that would be detrimental to your health, especially in the long term. Uh, but short term wise, unless it went extremely high, um, you wouldn't really suffer effects. You might have a headache and a few other things, but, you know, some edema someplace because of the excessive pressure. But for the most part, you know, you would still live fairly normally for years, uh, probably. And it wouldn't be until way down the line where you will have problems from it. Um, so that's high blood pressure. If you had low blood pressure, though, um, that could be uh, immediately uh, causing death, right? And if blood pressure went low enough, you couldn't support bodily function, you would die. Um, so if we had hypersecretion of hormones that increase heart rate, yeah, long term it's detrimental, but today it's not a really big, huge problem. If we had hypersecretion of a hormone that decreased heart rate, right, that if we had enough of it, that could cause a heart to stop and you would die. So it makes sense that we don't have any hormones that decrease heart rate. And we'll see this kind of trend in, in the other variables as well. Um, so extrinsic, uh, the only known hormones, the sympathomimetics, epinephrine, norepinephrine primarily, and the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, uh, all increase the heart rate uh, with increased release. Uh, for extrinsic, there's only one other thing we have to worry about in this, this section that we're going to worry about. And that's heat. And uh, independent of everything else, if we increase body temperature, um, uh, we increase uh, the heart rate. So they're connected there. So heart rate's pretty easy. I don't think there's anything new that most of you haven't seen before. Uh, we've even seen this picture of Lance Armstrong, I believe. It might have been a little different, but same idea. Um, this is wearing the yellow postal jersey. He used to ride for the U.S. Post Office, basically. Um, and... Uh, uh, the yellow jersey is, indicates he's leading the Tour de France at the time, and he's won that race multiple times. Um, but again, uh, uh, mostly because he cheated, or at least partly why he's cheated. So here's the summary table, the intrinsic autorhythmicity, the extrinsic, the ANS, and how the parasympathetic and sympathetic affect it. The hormones all increase it, and other heat. So if body temperature goes up, if your heat goes up, uh, heart rate will go up. So the next variable, a little more difficult, um, that's stroke volume. This tends to be the hardest one for most students because most of these things you haven't talked about before as students. So intrinsically, what controls stroke volume, uh, one of the things is what's called the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. Um, this is two different people, Dr. Frank and his friend, Dr. Starling, came up with this idea together. All right, and colloquial, colloquially, uh, you could say that it comes down to this idea of pump what you get. So the more blood the heart gets, the more blood it will pump out. All right, and so if we increase what's called the end diastolic volume, if we increase EDV, that increases the stretch of the muscle fibers, 
and that causes a greater overlap of cross bridges, which then results in a higher contraction uh, strength. So we'll push more blood out. So if we look, we'll see this kind of linear relationship here um, as the uh, end diastolic volume goes up, so does the force. So that's called the Frank Starling law, and it, and it deals with the volume. Increase the volume, increase the stroke volume. The second one is a little bit different, but in some respects, very similar. And this one's called preload. And as an undergraduate, I always had a problem with this word and still sort of do. But preload refers to the pressure of the heart below, uh, before ejection. So the load that you see um, uh, is often having to do with pressure. So the I think preload, pre and pressure go together. And so all preload really is, is the pressure of the ventricle before ejection. Uh, since it's the pressure differences that move blood, if I increase the pressure of the ventricle, I'm going to have a greater pressure difference and I'll have an increase in the stroke volume because of the increase in the strength contraction. So don't get the two confused. Frank Starling, uh, sometimes it's known as Starling's Law of the Heart, but the Frank Starling Law of the Heart tells me if I increase the volume, I increase the stroke volume. And preload tells me if I increase the pressure, I increase the stroke volume from an increase in strength. So those are the two intrinsic methods. All right. Extrinsically, we'll go through the ANS and hormones again. So for ANS, uh, the parasympathetic uh, system does go uh, small, but does go to the uh, ventricles. Uh, it releases acetylcholine to muscarinic receptors. Um, and what it does is it decreases the calcium concentration into the cardiac muscle cell. Since there's less concentration, there'll be less strength of contraction. So the parasympathetic system would decrease the strength of contraction, but it doesn't have a huge role. And again, it's likely because if we had a big parasympathetic stimulation, you could literally cause the heart to stop, right? So, and, or, or weaken it so much uh, from the strength of contraction that you wouldn't be able to pump blood effectively. And uh, whoever was serving would potentially die. Um, on the other side of the coin, the sympathetic system plays a major role in terms of stroke volume. And what it does is it releases norepinephrine to a beta-1 receptor. And that beta-1 receptor would increase the concentration of calcium uh, entering into the cell, which would cause more cross bridges, which would increase the strength of contraction. For extrinsic regulation of hormones, okay, uh, we get back to our sympathomimetics, the ones that mimic the sympathetic system. And if I increase the strength of those, uh, sorry, if I increase those, I increase the strength. Uh, for other, there's a number of them. Uh, the first one is called calcium conductance. Uh, conductance in this case refers to how much calcium removes across the cell membrane uh, in order to have function. And so if I increase the amount of calcium that moves across the cell membrane, I've increased the calcium conductance. And so if I increase calcium, I increase the strength of contraction uh, because calcium will uh, interact with beta-1 receptors, allow more uh, uh, changes uh, in a positive way to come into the cell during this time um, and would cause an increase in the strength of contraction. So calcium conductance, if I increase it, I increase the strength of contraction. Uh, the next one uh, is called afterload. And we saw the word load before. That was preload. That was the pressure of the heart before ejection. Afterload is the pressure of the heart. Um, sorry, the pressure outside the heart pushing back on the heart. So it's the pressure pushing back on the ventricle. Uh, the way to think about it is the pressure the heart has to overcome to eject blood. Uh, a good estimate of this is the diastolic blood pressure, okay? which would be the diastolic blood pressure in the outlet. So if you had a blood pressure of 120 over 80 uh, arterially, then your afterload would be estimated about 80 millimeters per mercury. Um, 
Note that it's one of the few variables besides the parasympathetic that if we increase the afterload, we end up with a decrease in stroke volume. Okay, so it's inversely proportional. Uh, we've seen this before in a vessel section. Venous return is very important. Um, in order to pump blood out of the heart, I think it's a, something we lose sight of often, we have to return blood to the heart first, right? If we don't have blood in the heart, we can't pump it. So things we can do to increase venous return, we've mentioned both of these before. Uh, the first one is venoconstriction. Remember, veins are, tend to be floppy, and they store 60 70% of your blood. So if you cause the veins to become rigid, you direct more blood back into the circulation. Um, and so that's venoconstriction will help increase venous return because there's less storage of blood outside of the uh, veins. Uh, the other one is the muscle pump, or sometimes known as thoracic pump. They function the same way, essentially, although one tends to be in the limbs, and the other one tends to be, obviously, in the chest area. Um, and what it is, it's muscular motion that causes the constriction and dilation of, um, well, probably not the constriction and dilation, but the movement of uh, blood from one end of the extremity, one end of the limb, back to the heart. Um, and so that's those series of valves and, and the contraction of muscles around it that helps to move blood back to where it belongs. So that's stroke volume. Um, for uh, stroke volume, uh, we had Frank Starling Law of the Heart, which dealt with volume, and Preload, which dealt with pressure. And both of those, if they increased, increased the stroke volume. Um, we also had extrinsically the ANS, both branches go there, although the parasympathetic has a fairly small innervation uh, back to the heart. Um, and those are uh, proportional to stroke volume. So if parasympathetic goes up, stroke volume goes down. Uh, and if sympathetic system goes up, the stroke volume goes up. Uh, hormones would be the sympathomimetics, the epinephrine and norepinephrine. And then calcium concentration, we increase calcium, we increase stroke volume. Venous return, we increase venous return, we increase stroke volume. And then afterload, which is inversely proportional. Meaning if we increase afterload, we increase stroke volume. Sorry, inverse proportional. If we increase afterload, we decrease stroke volume. So the last variable would be total peripheral resistance. And remember, we discussed uh, resistance and said that it's the actual diameter of the arterial that really plays a huge role in the regulation of things physiologically for um, pressure and flow. So the first intrinsic mechanism is called myogenic autoregulation. So myo means muscle, genic from, auto, self, regulation, I think you probably understand. So myogenic autoregulation says that arterioles can change their own diameter based on stretch and constriction and things like that. So they can constrict or dilate all by themselves based on the factors that are happening inside of them. That's called intrinsic because it comes from the blood vessel itself. The other thing that's intrinsic are local chemicals. Remember, local chemicals are called local because they cannot leave the local area, right? So in most cases, it's very tight uh, range because these molecules have to diffuse from one place to another. Um, remember that all local chemicals cause vasodilation. They make the blood vessel more wider than there would be without it. Uh, there are a couple of things that happen in the muscle that probably lead to this. First of all, many of the metabolic byproducts like carbon dioxide, hydrogen ion, lactate, um, ADP, adenosine diphosphate, um, those are all examples of things that uh, would cause dilation at the local level. All right, And the dilation would happen to increase blood flow to that area of the body and that would happen uh, especially in response to like exercise. So if it happened for exercise, it would be called active. That's the exercise part. Hyperemia, hyper increased 
hyperemia blood. So active hyperemia is an increase in blood flow uh, due to exercise. Uh, we also have some very potent vasodilators that aren't necessarily metabolic products, but potassium, nitric oxide, adenosine, and histamine are all fairly important vasodilators that we use medically. Um, so that's the intrinsic uh, mechanisms. Uh, extrinsic uh, is actually easy if you remember one of the issues with it. Uh, there are no parasympathetic fibers that go to blood vessels. So all of the ANS conversation is going to be sympathetic only because that's the only uh, portion of the ANS that goes to the heart, uh, or in this case, sorry, the blood vessels uh, to change the diameter, change the resistance. Um, so uh, the sympathetic system is affected by the norepinephrine at the alpha-1 receptors. Uh, it influences also the vasomotor tone, uh, which can cause constriction or dilation. Um, so the sympathetic system is just that vasomotor tone, that tonic activity we talked about, that can change things if we increase it or decrease it. Um, hormones uh, all cause constriction, so there's none that cause dilation. And the primary one are the sympathomimetics again, that's epinephrine and, for example, uh, uh, the uh, norepinephrine and, and things like that. Um, there's also some other vasoconstrictors that are very important, uh, angiotensin 2. So angio refers to vessel tensin, uh, tension, so that causes constriction. Um, oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone, both hormones that come from the posterior pituitary, also play a role in the extrinsic uh, control of hor uh, from hormones uh, for TPR. So there's a bunch of different hormones circulating in the blood that can have an effect. So here's a nice summary of, of everything. So take a look at it. It's probably pretty important to understand. Um, one of the things that uh, you should also look at our units. We've talked about this numerous times. Units are important. Um, so for heart rate, the units are beats per minute. I think most of you probably knew that. Uh, for stroke volume, probably most of you would know that it's referring to um, uh, it's units, mLs per beat. Uh, but TPR is kind of the hard one. And TPR has these really kind of strange units. They're minutes times millimeter of mercury over ml so minutes times millimeter of mercury over ml down here on the bottom left um, and uh, so we're going to see those units potentially um, for that factor uh, that we're going to look at and control but you should know those as well what the units are all right so before we get too much more into anything it's probably a good place to stop the video and we'll talk about some reflexes involved with um, controlling things within the body uh, and then look at a few odds and ends and uh, we should be close to finishing uh, from this point.